I was watching uh, an old Disney film with Caleb uh, the other day. I forget which one, because Disney films are so often uh, on our TV at home. But as I began uh, watching it with Caleb, a notice came up just before the film was about to start. And it said, this film includes negative depictions and or mistreatment of peoples or culture. This is not OK, but they are left in uh, so that people can talk about them and learn from them. Um, <laughs> To, to be honest, I feel we should have some sort of statement at the start of uh, this passage as well, as we explore the life of Jacob. We find in these passages, don't we, um, that we would identify um, just outrageous misbehavior and mistreatment of others, which demonstrates the huge cultural differences between then, like 4,000 years ago, and now. But in all this, in all this scripture, God remains the same. The truth that God never gives up. God never writes Jacob off. God turns the brokenness of this situation into blessing through his amazing grace and mercy and his relentless love. Watching Disney films with uh, Caleb and Hope reminds me so much of all the Disney films that I used to love to watch when I was grow growing up. My favourite was Robin Hood, uh, that was my favourite, and the Aristocats. And though I never dared to admit it to my friends at the time, another one of my favourites was Beauty and the Beast. Oh, I just love it. Uh, and, and another one was Aladdin. Aladdin, the story of a humble street kid um, falling in love with a princess. And uh, the story goes that he finds a genie's lamp and he uh, wishes to, to win the girl. He wishes for a better life. But Aladdin goes from wishing that he was somebody else, uh, wishing that he had more money, more stature in society, to realise that being himself is enough. And this culminates in Aladdin not only marrying Princess Jasmine, the girl he fell in love with at first sight, but also upholding his promise to use his third wish to free Genie. If you haven't seen it, it's a good film. Uh, this, of course, is just a children's story, though, but it is based on um, Arabic folklore, uh, which was first written in the 19th century. And I think reading our story uh, this morning, reading our scripture, you get a sense here of Jacob viewing God a bit like a genie. As we saw last week, Jacob had sent, uh, was sent away by his parents to Haran. His mum, Rebecca, was fearful that Esau would, would kill Jacob after they deceitfully uh, stole the, 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 the family inheritance, the blessing from Esau, and gave it to, um, and Isaac gave it to Jacob. So Jacob was sent to the land of Haran, to Laban, Rebekah's brother, some 500 miles away. And you can see on the screen there just the distance that Jacob had to go. Um, on his way, whilst he was uh, sleeping, God appears to Jacob in a dream and promises to Jacob um, that he will always be with him, that God would always watch over Jacob. God would fulfill the promises that he had already made to bless Jacob, to bless all peoples of the earth through Jacob. And that, to be honest, should have been enough for Jacob. It was one of those wow moments, an undisputable encounter with the living God that should have transformed Jacob's life. Um, such that we see in the life of sort of Moses when he encounters God at the burning bush, or Isaiah, or Peter, or John, or Paul. So many characters who have such amazing encounters with God, their lives are transformed because of it. But seemingly not so for Jacob. We read at the beginning of our passage today that Jacob's understanding of God and himself, well, it was pretty skew -if. Jacob began to negotiate with God rather than simply receiving the blessing uh, with gratitude. He began to hammer out the key points of a contract. So let's have a look at it. If you will, then I will. That's what he says to God. If you, God, will be with me and watch over me and feed me and clothe me and return me to my father's household, 
then I, Jacob, will declare you as my God. I will build you a house of worship and give you one-tenth of all that you have given me. Now, I have to say here, uh, Jacob's theology here is rather dodgy, okay? This is not something, uh, an example to follow. This understanding that we should hinge our belief on God as a response to our prayerful sort of wants and desires and wishes on God's protection over us or provision for us, it's quite frankly flawed. This is called transactional theology. It's the idea that we meet God on equal terms, that God has something that we want and we have something that God wants, so let's bargain a deal, shall we? This is perhaps something we're all a bit guilty of if we're truthful in our lives. I've probably worn this theological t-shirt more times than I care to admit. For example, when we say, if you heal me, God, I'll, I'll volunteer more. If you lead me to a better job or give me that promotion, then, then, then I'll be able to give more to the church. If you mend this relationship, God, then I'll be kinder to them. If you get me out of this med mess, God, then I'll go to church more. If you do this, God, then I'll do that. Why do we do this? A.W. Tozer once said, left to our, ourselves, we immediately tend to reduce God to manageable terms. We want to get him where we can use him, or at least know where he is when we need him. We want a God we can in some measure control. But as we see, God is not a genie who just requests wishes, like Aladdin who said to a genie, if you grant two of my wishes, then on the third I'll set you free. Likewise, God is not our equal whom we can negotiate with. God is the most high over all the earth, the psalmist says. The transactional theology that, that tells God, if you do this, God, then I'll do that, quickly leads to disillusionment. How many times have we heard people say, I don't believe in God because he didn't do X, Y, Z, because he didn't heal so-and-so, because he didn't provide in this way that I was seeking. In other words, God didn't do what they crave, expected, or demanded, therefore God doesn't exist. Jacob's transactional theology here, if you, God, then I will, is simply no way to approach God, no way to pray to God. But we know that prayer is a foundation of faith, don't we? God longs to hear our prayers for us to interact with God. But we need to be careful what we pray for, that we're not just asking for what we want in life. For prayer is declaring our trust in God in all the situations that we face. Jacob got this the wrong way around, didn't he? Jacob felt that he knew best and he was waiting for God to uphold his end of the bargain. And perhaps that's why Jacob um, spent so long in Haran. Jacob was doing what he thought was best. Jacob was trusting in himself, in his own plans. Interestingly, in chapter uh, 29, verses 1 to 30, these 30 verses summarize 20 years of Jacob's life. Yet it does not contain a single reference to God. 20 years of Jacob's life, no reference to God whatsoever. Jacob was going about his own way. And yet we know that in, in the midst here, God was at work. God never gives up on him. God is always with Jacob at work in his life to fulfill his promises. But God lets Jacob be Jacob. God lets him reap what he sows. God allows those 20 years in Haran to happen so that his eyes may be opened. And in verses 1 to 11, uh, we read uh, that Jacob falls in love. It's love at first sight for Jacob. Jacob saw Rachel from afar and thought, yes, yes. 
It's like when Aladdin meets Princess Jasmine all over again. Jacob would do anything for her. And did you see in the passage there a little bit of male bravado? Uh, when, when Rachel comes uh, with, with her sheep, uh, I, I, I get sort of the image that, 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 that Jacob sort of rolls up his sleeves and said, I'll move away the stone, it's fine, and rolls away this stone from the well uh, against the wishes of the other shepherds, may I say, um, to try to impress Rachel. So Rachel takes Jacob back to meet her dad, his uncle. And so we're going to carry on reading from verse 14 uh, to 30. And, and those of a sensitive nature should put their fingers in their ears at this point, I think. Uh, but we'll read verses 14 through to 30. Um, so after Jacob, after Jacob had uh, stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. <clears throat> now Laban had two daughters. Uh, the name of the elder one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Oh, oh isn't that lovely? I must remember that for uh, our next, uh, my next wedding anniversary card. <laughs> these, these 12 years, Ruth, of marriage to you have only been a few days. Uh, no, uh, don't tell, tell her that. Um, let's keep it a surprise. Uh, then Jacob said, then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Ziha uh, to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the elder one. Finish uh, this daughter's bridal week and then I will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. I know, shocking, right? <laughs> And Jacob did so. Uh, so he finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. Laban gave his servant, um, Bilha to his daughter, Rachel, as her attendant. And Jacob made love to Rachel also. And his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban for another seven years. <laughs> Yeah, wow. So then, kind of regretting that I gave myself this passage to preach on. Uh, but as I said at the start of this passage, the deception here, the mistreatment, especially that of Leah, um, that seemed acceptable back then, just to put it out there. This is in no way acceptable now in today's culture, nor should this passage be upheld to endorse any sort of polygamy or forced labour or marrying or even sleeping with anyone uh, that you don't truly love. Um, maybe, perhaps there's a warning here for, for groomsmen not to get blind drunk on your wedding night because you never know what the father or the bride will do, uh, but I don't think that's a good application point, uh, just putting that out there. So what can we take from this passage, which, to be honest, seems a whole world away, doesn't it, from our current culture and experience of life? Well, there's three points uh, that I want to uh, share with you and draw out uh, from this. The first two are seeds and soil, because as any gardener will strive towards, if you sow good seeds in healthy soil, then you're likely to get good fruit. So what were the seeds that Jacob had sown? Well, we know that Jacob was a trickster, wasn't he? He was a deceiver, a cheater, a grifter, a liar. These are the seeds of bad fruit. 
another animated film that, that my kids uh, love is called Kung Fu Panda. And I won't tell you the whole plot line, uh, but there's a scene in which Master Ugwe is trying to pass on some, uh, some wisdom to his student, Shifu. Ugwe, Ugwe says, look at this peach tree, Shifu. I cannot make it blossom when it suits me, nor can I make it bear fruit uh, before its time. And Shifu replies, but there are things that we can control. I can control uh, where the fruit will fall. I can control where to plant the seed. And that is no illusion, Master. Ugwe replies, ah, yes. But no matter what you do, that seed will grow to be a peach tree. You may wish for an apple or an orange, but you will get a peach. You reap what you sow. And there's warnings throughout scripture of this, um, this idea that you reap what you sow. Proverbs 11 says, cruel people bring trouble on themselves. That the wicked are brought down by their wickedness. The prophet Obadiah says, as you have done, it will be done to you. These are warnings, warnings that if you sow bad seeds, you're going to get bad fruit. But there's also encouragement in the scriptures. Jesus says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Proverbs says, whoever gives to others will get richer. Those who help others will themselves be helped. If you sow then good seeds, you'll reap good fruit. And Jesus sums up this principle of the seeds we sow is the fruits that we reap by saying the measure you use, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And as we see in this passage, Jacob, well, he gets a taste of his own medicine. Jacob, who fooled his near blind father, Isaac, in a tent, was fooled in a tent when he was blind drunk, blinded by the night, blinded by lust, blinded by love. Jacob, who was the most calculated uh, way, stole uh, what could be returned. The blessing of his birthright, of um, Esau's both birthright, was tricked into marriage that could not be undone. Jacob, who begrudged and resisted the tradition of the firstborn going first, fell victim to Laban's explanation that it was wrong to give the younger before the firstborn. Jacob, who complained to Laban, saying, why did you cheat me, echoed the words that his brother Esau spoke about him. Jacob planted seeds of lies and deceit, and therefore he harvested a crop of lies and deceit. He fooled Esau, he fooled his uh, father Isaac, and in return he was fooled by Laban. In other words, Jacob got jacob Jacob got jacob Not only were the seeds bad, but let's face it, the soil was bad too. It's uh, said a plant is only as good as the soil that it is planted with in. Healthy soil is rich in organic matter and living organism. There's good bacteria in it, which allows plants not just to survive, but to thrive. Jacob, though, had not cultivated such good soil in his life. His understanding of God and his relationship with him that we saw in those opening verses was, was pretty poor, was skewiff, treating God more like a genie than a divine loving deity. There was no spiritual depth in Jacob's life, no trust in God, which is so vividly symbolized as rivers of living water in the Psalms. So in essence, we could say that Jacob's soil was, was dry and pretty lifeless. In the parable of the sower that Jesus uh, said, Jacob would be the soil that, that, that was all rocky, or the soil that was full of thorns. And, he, and Jacob was producing dry and lifeless fruit. But as for us, if we want to produce good fruit and good seeds, we need to cultivate 
good, healthy soil in which is found deep-rooted, spiritual, filled relationship with God. Matthew 13, 23 says, But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. They hear God's word and they, they take it to heart. This is the one who produces a crop who yielded a hundred, sixty or thirty times that which was sown. It's here in the good soil that the fruit of the Spirit finds real growth. This is not something that we can force by ourselves. It can only be grown in us, grown in a healthy environment that we cultivate as we deepen our relationship with God, as we hear his word, as we understand it and take it to heart. To be good soil um, that the farmer sows his seed on. We need healthy soil to sow seeds of good fruit. And to do this, we need a saviour. God didn't send us a genie uh, to grant us wishes to make our lives better. God didn't send us a genie to to grant what, what our hearts desires. No, God came to earth in human form, as our saviour. In our passage, we uh, meet people who desperately need a saviour, don't we? Jacob, Laban, Rachel, Leah, all reaping the bad seeds that have been sown in their lives. Yet, God amazingly shows mercy to them. Leah, who, who personally, the story of Leah personally breaks my heart. Leah might have been unchosen by Jacob, but Leah was chosen by God. Chosen by God to be the mother in the bloodline of our saviour, the king of kings. God blesses Leah with four sons, and with each birth, Leah praises God, who heard her cry, who saw her despair, and provided for her in ways in which only God can. And God provides for ways, uh, in ways only he can in our lives as well. God gives us a saviour with no strings attached, offers us forgiveness of sins, expecting nothing in return. He doesn't need our gifts or our empty promises. He doesn't want our faith to be conditional or transactional. He wants, he deserves our unconditional devotion. And as we give that to God, we give that as we realise that God is God and we are not. And his love is relentless. His mercy is unceasing. His grace is freely given to each and every one of us. So I wonder what kind of seeds are you sowing in your life today which will bear fruit tomorrow? Is your soil healthy, full of life and sustenance from which... uh, fruit can grow are you trusting today in god our savior in all aspects of your life aware that god is god and you are not aware that he is working in time in your life to bring about the goodness in you for you in all your days just as we reflect on those questions this morning let us pray Let's give our our hearts, our minds, those things that may be weighing us down this morning to God in prayer. 